welcome to George Mason University's Studio A. My name is Rick Davis, and today our guest is Barry Sisson of Cavalier Films, a Virginia-based film production company. Mr. Sisson is the producer of, among other films, Charlie's Party and the recently completed Familiar Strangers. Please join us in welcoming Barry Sisson. Thanks for having me. It's great. Thanks for being here. Uh, the first question is about Cavalier Films, uh, your, your production company. How was it created? Well, how the company was created is, is maybe a different story than how we came to it. Uh, I was in another business that had nothing to do with film, and I always, throughout my life, felt like I should be uh, producing films. And um, reached a point in, in my career where I just felt like um, I wasn't doing what I should be doing, so I left that business and uh, set about uh, figuring out how to get into the film business and create the films that, that I love. And when you when you left the the business, which I think was uh, electronic security, that's correct. Uh, you, uh, can you talk about just how that transition happened for you? Uh, there was a a key moment that I that I really remember. Um, you know, I, I think again because I wasn't doing what I really felt like I should be doing with my life. Um, I was. Um, so captured in this world of business and, 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 and captured in, in success. I was, I was very successful in the business. Um, and my wife and I were so, realized we were overwhelmed in that world and we took a day off and we said, let's go see a movie, which is what I always do when I need a yeah. renewal. And I said, let's go see something fun and just you know, take us out of this world and have a nice relaxing day. And we went to see a little film called American Beauty. Mm because I had it confused with a funny little light film. And uh, at the end of that film, I remember the credits rolled and the theater lights came on and, and we were still sitting there and I, either she looked at me or I looked at her and we said, what are we doing? And it was uh, a week or two after that that I went to the board and tried to explain why I was gonna leave a company that was doing so well and um, they didn't believe me that I just was done. Wow. And so you must have been passionate about film growing up and throughout your life to make that big break? Yeah, I remember going to my first um, mature audience film. Um, I was maybe 14 because I remember my father was angry that my mother had taken me to this film. <laughs> and, but it, it depicted real life. It was, you know, other films that I had seen, when we all see the, the kids' films when we're growing up and we love them and they're entertaining, there was something about this that just sort of touched on the world and on real reality that I thought was so important. And I can just still remember thinking at that point, wow, that mm. there's a magic there that I want to be involved with. And I think throughout my life I had various thoughts on how I would get into the business and um, didn't quite do it until um, I was able to leave business and use business as my entry to the business. Well, speaking of business, uh, Cavalier Films has a, an interesting, distinctive business model. It's organized a little differently from a lot of companies. Can you talk about how your, uh, how your model works? Um, there's a lot of things that are unique about Cavalier, but the one that is perhaps the most relevant and the most talked about is that we have, uh, we operate a film fund and a production company. And the film fund is made up with people I would say much like I was when I was in the business world. I had a passion for films. I love films. I love to get involved in films. And this vehicle allows our partners to really be a part of bringing the films to life, uh, as, as much a part as they really want to be, uh, while not taking the primary responsibility for making films that I had to do to, to find the way. So this involvement of our partners in our, in our productions is a very unique element uh, in feature film production. Are they investors in the conventional sense where they expect a return, or are they partners in more of a spiritual sense or a participatory sense? Well, I think both, actually. Um, I, I, I always tell people that you don't invest in film the same way you invest in treasury bills or mm -hmm. even in the stock market where you buy a stock and you maybe you research the business but you know it's it's somewhat of a passive investment yeah. investment with us involves financial return and intellectual return and if you don't have a balance of the two if you don't love films you don't really want to invest with us now having said that uh, we're business people and we created a business of 
to produce quality feature films, uh, and it is, it is our intent and expectation that, um, that there'll be a financial return. We, we don't do passion projects that are just mm -hmm. art pieces. Mm -hmm. We do films that we think can get out and touch the world. You know, what this reminds me of in a, in a pleasant way is the old-fashioned um, theater angel uh, system in the sort of the glory days of Broadway where a number of small investors would get together and rally around a, a project. Well, it is. One thing that's different is that our investors don't rally around a specific script. They, they become somewhat like a studio. In uh -huh. that we do a slate of films within our fund. Um, that provides additional opportunities for exposure. It, uh, re it uh, spreads the risk over multiple projects. So it is a little different than mm -hmm. a lot of independent film investing that is all about one project. They're supporting the, the concept of Cavalier more than a specific title. Uh, yes, I would say mm -hmm. it's a good way to put it, yeah. yes. Well, we have a wonderful studio audience composed of George Mason University students, and I know they have some questions they'd like to ask. Uh, Who would like to be first? Yes, sir. Uh, hi, my name is Justin. Um, would you recommend that film students also take classes in business management uh, if they want to start their own production company? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the film world is a business. And I think that um, certainly one of our advantages in this world and uh, the reason that we have success uh, is, is our business-like approach. And I think that that knowledge of, of how businesses work and basic business principles and just never forgetting that that creation of films is a blending of art and commerce is very very important. Anybody else have a question? Yes. Hi, I'm Drew. I was wondering uh, what kind of suggestions you would give to filmmakers who are looking to finance their first independent film. You know the big key the key word that I hear there is first independent film. And that first mm -hmm. film is so important to anybody that, that, that wants to be in the business because you are judged on your credits. Uh, we have a, 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 an almost inviolate rule that, that we won't work with a director that hasn't done a feature film. So that, that, that first film sort of proves your mettle. Um, the problem is it's very hard to get people to finance that first film for you. Um, because there, there are tremendous risks and people don't know what you can do. So uh, the, your, my advice to you is you go to everybody that you know, friends and family, uh, don't be shy about it, and you share your passion and find people that are willing to back that passion. Terrific. Another question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Monica, and I was wondering what advice would you give a film producer looking to go in business with a partner? Go in business with a partner. Um, you know, I, I was um, a, a business consultant um, in the interim of leaving my big company while I was putting together the business plan for Cavalier. And I would get asked that question a lot, people starting businesses and, and, and looking for partners. And um, the biggest thing that I can say is um, make sure that you need a partner, that, that you're g finding a partner for the right reasons. Partnerships are hard, uh, and, and um, I think that you need to be making the decision for the right reason to have a partner. Now, now I have a partner, um, I have, I, and, I'm, and I'm very fortunate to have the right partner, a great guy that can fill in the blanks and some things that, I, that he compliments me tremendously. But I think a big question is, ask yourself, can you buy what you're getting with a partner? And if you can buy it, you should try and buy it buy that skill, buy that component to your business. Um, because a partner is like a marriage and they're going to be there forever and, and breaking up is very, very hard to do. <laughs> Sounds like a song. <laughs> yes, cue the music. Uh, that's a, a wonderful advice for these students and, and, and I have a question that's uh, kind of a follow-up in a way. Um, you have a partner, you have these investors, you have a, a, a company that seems to have a lot of voices at the table. How do you go about selecting a project and, and moving it forward into production? Um, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, we do have a lot of voices in our company, and uh, they have played a, a tremendous, uh, valuable role in, in bringing our films to life. Um, ultimately, the decision for which project that gets, that gets selected rests with my partner, Mark Lieberman, and myself. Um, 
but everybody's input is important because you know, making a film is a very collaborative process. Um, you need to, you can get closeted in, and it's important to have other inputs. Uh, you know. now, now, let me shift gears a little bit. Selecting the project, mm -hmm. we're always reading scripts constantly, hundreds uh, per yeah, year. Yeah, I was going to say how many uh, hundreds, on an average year. Hundreds. Um, and what you're looking for is something that touches your heart, touches your soul. When you select it, you're going to live with it. It's going to be one of the hardest things you ever do in your life to take it from the beginning to the end. You have to have the passion for it, and that passion has to stay alive. So you're looking for something that is that important to you. And once you've made that choice, uh, how do you go about developing that and, and moving the script forward? Uh, the development process uh, is, is the process of, of taking a script and then evaluating every aspect of that script to make sure that it deserves to be on the screen. Every page of a, of a screenplay is one minute of film. You have, in our world, about an hour and a half mm -hmm. to tell this story. And every minute has to be important to carry in the story forward. And so we study the scripts. We bring other people into that process through uh, table reads and staged readings. Mm -hmm. In fact, we did one at George Mason yep. University for our, um, for our current film. And that staged reading helps us to have the characters embody themselves, have the plot roll out in front of an audience, and then we question that audience to see what the, what the input is. And then our partners, you know, they read every script that we're evaluating, and, and some are very, very involved in giving us ideas on how those scripts can be better, how they can be nuanced in ways that can become very important to the, to the ultimate product. Yeah, I had the pleasure of working on that, uh, on that workshop uh, for the current film, which was then called Disconnected. That's and it's now called Familiar Strangers, just one of the many changes <laughs> that uh, happen right. in the life of a film. We actually have a wonderful trailer that you've provided with us of Familiar Strangers, and uh, let's take a look at it. Oh, here they are! Hey, oh, my gracious! Oh. Did you know that Brian is home? He's a successful writer, you know. A masterpiece. I think I'll wait for the movie. Not everyone can just leave and become authors. Somebody's got to mind the shop, you know. We don't have the kind of help we used to. We are going to have Thanksgiving dinner, right? And I bet it's a home-cooked meal and not some turkey in a box or something. Okay. Looks like a Happy Meal on steroids. Ooh, is there a toy? Have you ever thought of mom and dad as just people? Do you have anything for schizophrenia? I'm going down to Mexico and I'm, I'm never coming back. Bungalows. There's this thing I gotta do with my family, a goofy, embarrassing tradition. I'm gonna take these away and I'm What's going on back there, Kenneth? I was talking to Brian, Mammoth. I'm glad to be home. Don't make any hasty decisions there, Brian. If I have a doubt. 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 Razor blades and sleeping pills. Can't be that bad. You don't know my family. <laughs> I love the way that ends. Uh, <laughs> it's such a pleasure for me to hear those those words and see those scenes, having lived with this uh, script as a play, basically, for about a week, uh, where we rehearsed it with professional actors and some students, and uh, really treated it as a piece of theater, uh, and then put it up in front of your, your folks uh, for a very spirited discussion. Is that a, a typical development process for you? Yeah, very much so. The, the whole idea of, of doing a staged reading in front of an audience is the best test that you can have of your script and of the story that you're going to tell. Um, very, very important to the process. We always do that mm -hmm. with our films. And I was struck by the 
level perceptiveness and and the vigor of uh, of the audience response, both pro and con. Uh, and I wonder how much of that uh, was communicated and in what form back to the writer, and and what changes were were made. Not of course specifically, but the sort of how you communicated those things back to the writer. Um, well, we filmed it, and the writer ha uh, got that uh, a DVD of the stage reading mm -hmm. that he could he could you know, listen to and, and watch, and then hear the comments mm -hmm. and the questions and answers. But but we take the impressions from the staged reading and the, and then parse every single one of them with the writer, with mm -hmm. the director, um, to you know decide you know how do you deal with this? Is is this, is this real? Is it not real? You know many thoughts come up that you haven't had before and it expands your consciousness on the project to a point that that leads into very unexpected areas areas that uh, ultimately enhance the final film and we have had stage readings that killed films mm -hmm. they don't work and and you know that input is very much a part of the process you, you know you say you're surprised at how deep it goes our partners are very perceptive people and they have something at stake. And they have something at stake, yeah. yeah. Uh, I remember one of the questions from you to the audience was, uh, does anybody have a, a certain kind of house that we can <laughs> shoot a scene in? Did that work out? Did you, did you get a location? Uh, not that? from that. Yeah. No, actually, you know, um, we have good relationships with a lot of theaters because we go to a lot of movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually found the house that we were shooting in, well, one of the houses that we were shooting in from an email from a movie theater to their patrons. Uh, at telling people that we were coming to town wow. and looking for a house. Now, one, another one of our houses was one of our partner's houses. And uh, I'm not sure he would do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Although, at the screening, I was rather shocked when he came up to me and said, you can have my house any time. Wow. But I think that was just an emotional reaction to the film yeah. and probably wouldn't come true. <laughs> uh, a film now, this film is now complete uh, and looking for distribution. Uh, how, how does Cavalier relate to the whole distribution mechanism in the film industry? Well, Mark and I spend a lot of our time um, integrating ourselves and our company into the industry of film. Mm -hmm. And it's very important the relationships that you have so that you do have entry when, uh, when you have a product. Now, I'm fortunate that I started off with a successful film, The Station Agent, and, and that gives me entry. Again, it comes back to you're, you're judged by what you have done before. Mm -hmm. um, so we have spent the last several months putting together the team that will market this film, and that team includes publicists and uh, producers, reps. Uh, CAA will be rep representing mm. this film, which Terrific. is a you know, very prestigious agency. Um, so that's that's how we'll approach it, and we will look for the right platform to introduce it to the industry and the distributors, and and it'll find its place. Will this go uh, in festivals, or are you looking for another route? Well, the right festival is always the best place. If you can if you can introduce your film to the distributors with a really appreciative audience, and and showing it to all of them at once. Uh, that's the best way to do it because hopefully they feed off of each other and and sort of validate each other's opinions. Now everybody wants the film and it gets a best launch that way. It's not the only way to launch a film by any means, but that is what you try to do first. And then if you don't find the right platform, you use alternative methods. What about YouTube? Um, <laughs> You know, that, that gets a little bit of a chatter, but YouTube is becoming a very powerful thing. Um, it doesn't factor into our planning right now, but I'm not saying it wouldn't in the future. It's a way of getting notice in this world that is very much emerging. Now, you have a very strict budget idea uh, for your films. On your website, it says $1 million. Uh, how did you arrive at that figure, and, and how closely do you stick to it? Well, we stick to our budgets Tremendously, it's one of the reasons. I mean, we're we're a very disciplined company. We are we're a business, and businesses, uh, my businesses, need to be disciplined and, and have plans and stick to them. Um, uh, we're actually we've actually increased that budget limit um, for future films to a million and a half if we need it. Although we do shoot for the million dollar cap still, um, and you do that by budgeting clearly sharing uh, a very clear vision with everybody that's going to be involved and then planning accordingly. <laughs> how do you, uh, this question sounds impolitic, but how do you attract major talent when you have a publicized budget cap like that that people can read between the lines? 
Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, uh, here's the thing to realize. You know, our actors, or at least our lead actors, can make a lot of money. Hmm. And, um, and many of them do. I mean, um, I guess it would be improper for me to mention the daily rate of a DJ Qualls, mm -hmm. and so I won't do that. But it's probably a hundred times more than he would make on our film. Um, and some actors that will work with us get jobs that pay them million or millions mm -hmm. of dollars. So why would they do an independent film? They do it because they like the material. They do it because th th there's time between the big paydays. They do it because they want to stretch and prove that they can do more mm -hmm. than what they are slotted into by the Hollywood uh, world. Um, there's, nobody does our films because of the money they're mm -hmm. going to make. They do it because they want to act, and they want to act in, in they want to stretch. Uh, think Holly yeah. Berry in Monsters yes. Ball. Yes, yeah. You know? So they're doing it for the, for the artistic passions and, and opportunities. That's exactly right. Yeah. They Terrific. like the material. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's time to turn back to our students for a, another round of questions. Um, who out there has a question for Barry Sisson? Yes. Hi, my name is Dawn, and I was wondering, um, what's the difference between the Hollywood film industry um, and the independent film industry? Uh, the difference between Hollywood and independent films, um, industries. It's, in it's, a, it's a very interesting question, and it's very complex, but I'll try and break it down into, very, into, more simplistic, into a more simplistic answer than, is, than, than it really is. You know, Hollywood does a great job of making the films that, that make the most money. They make big films targeted at big audiences. And they make $50 million films, $100 million films, $150 million films, because they know that that's the lowest risk in making films. They also know that, that they're shooting for the masses rather than sp specific interests and um, maybe higher IQ levels or something. That, maybe that's in, in fair. One way we put it is they make, they make films for 15 to 25-year-old boys. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we make films for um, a more mature audience, you know, 25 and up, people would think. And then we hope that we reach the others. Um, but Hollywood and independents work together. How, you know, Hollywood is, are smart business people. It's corporations now. And what they recognize is that we can make a film for a lot less than they can make a film for. And yet they become our distribution arm. So what they do is they make these films that they're so good at making, and then they turn to the independent producer to make their more thoughtful fare. So we're all really part of the same machine, and we are a strategic element of the Hollywood industry. Another question? Maybe over here? Yeah. Hi. My name is Margo. Um, are you hiring interns? <laughs> are we hiring interns? We, we, we definitely use interns when we go into production. And there are certain jobs, you know, even when we're at Idle, that, that interns can do. Um, interns are a big part of this industry, and it's a big part of the, the, the way in for somebody looking the way in, because you need to learn how a film set works and how the production world works. So yes, interns are a big part of this world. And uh, was this just an, a job interview happening here in, in front yeah. of us? <laughs> <laughs> is there? An, did you bring a resume? I did. Yeah, good. Uh, is there another question for Barry? Yeah. Um, besides producing, is there anything like as far as hobbies you like to do? Ah, uh, gosh, hobbies that I think you know, I'm I, I'm a not a real good example of a real balanced person. <laughs> uh, I, I don't really have uh, you know hobbies. Um, that really come to mind. Uh, business has always been a hobby. I, I love to analyze businesses, and I am an investor even outside of, of, of film. Um, but you know, to me, there's, there's no better way to spend a, a moment that you find that you can do what you want to do than going to see movies. I mean, yesterday afternoon, I had an hour free. And I stretched that hour into an hour and a half, and I went to see a movie. And it was, <laughs> uh, you know, a, a, a painful and wonderful experience. Mm. And it's research. And it's research, yeah. I, I, that's what I tell my wife when I'm going to do, I'm going to do some research. Right. And, and your accountant, right? 
and Matt County. Yeah, right. Uh, anybody else have a, a question for, for Barry? Yes. Hi, I'm Sophie. Um, how do you go about finding your talent for your films? Uh, how do we go about finding the talent? Um, you know, uh, we have a, a, a rule in our business plan that says we will, we will only make films with recognizable talent. And um, so I'll, I'll limit the, the answer and expand if I need to. To find that recognizable talent, we always hire a casting director to work with us as part of our team to facilitate uh, contact to the actors that we need to build the film around. Well, I have a sort of a final kind of question for you, and it has to do with, with a long-range vision. This is a, still a fairly new company, a couple films under your belt, more in, in the works. Do you have a, a long-range plan or a strategic plan for Cavalier Films? A strategic plan for Cavalier Films is, um, yeah, it's probably a good final question. Um, <laughs> and, it's, and it's a hard one to answer. It's as simple as we started this company with a vision to make quality films that touch people, that, that move people, that make people better when they walk out of the theater, more in touch with some basic element. And we're already doing that. And you know, I, the long-range plan is to continue to do that, to develop a reputation of making films that matter so that we're taken seriously, so that our films are looked forward to. And 20 years from now, um, if I'm still alive, and I hope I am, or if I'm not, I, you know, I, I would hope that Mark Lieberman, my partner, is continuing the, doing it exactly the way we're doing it now and making great films. Something you said really uh, resonates with me, and I just want you to repeat it and expand upon it briefly, and that is uh, films that make people better, that, that help them you know, feel something. Uh, how many film companies have that as a mission? I don't know of any others. <laughs> We're unique, um, but I think that a lot of independent filmmakers do strive to find films that matter, that, that, that touch on essential truths that mm -hmm. people aren't in touch with. Um, so I don't think it's as unique what makes us unique is sort of the combination of the business approach, the, the very focused business plan, and the ongoing nature of our business. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful project, and it's a wonderful film coming out soon, Familiar Strangers. And uh, Barry Sisson, thank you for being here. Thanks My for having me. My name is Rick me. Davis, and this has been Studio A.